Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction. I've been looking forward to this conference because embedded processing really represents the heart of what I'm talking about. We've gone from an era of very large computers. In fact, when I was at MIT in 1965, a computer took about, I'd say, three times the size of this presentation theater. It cost $11 million, was a thousand times less powerful than your ARM-based processor and your cell phone today. And we're moving towards an era where computers are not going to be discrete objects. They're going to be everywhere. They're, I'm working on one project to put uh, computing in your clothing to keep track of your health. Uh, we have them already in our, in our pockets. They'll make their way into our bodies and brains. Uh, in fact, there are quite a few people already that are walking around with computers inside their bodies. <clears throat> Even replacing biological neurons. If you have Parkinson's disease, you can have an embedded computer in your brain that replaces those neurons, and the neurons in the vicinity now get signals from a computer. They used to get them from the biological neurons. They're very happy doing that. And the latest generation of this FDA-approved neural implant allows you to download new software to your embedded processor. I'm not sure if it's an ARM processor, but uh, it, <clears throat> from outside the patient. And we're going to be moving to an era with ubiquitous computing everywhere inside the environment. Uh, we'll have really billions of computers uh, deeply integrated into our economic infrastructure. Uh, I'm an optimist also, actually, most people put me in that camp. I do have a chapter on the intertwined promise versus peril of these technologies. There's a downside. Uh, but the, the applications, uh, cell phones, the internet, uh, are basically democratizing technologies that enable us to uh, communicate with one another and meet that basic human need. Uh, are definitely making this a, a better place. Uh, and you can measure that. The World Bank reported that poverty was cut in half in Asia over the last 10 years because of information technology, because of computing, because of embedded computing and all of those applications. 15 years ago, many people in these Asian societies were pushing a plow. They now have thriving information economies using ARM-based uh, cell phones. Uh, according to that same report, they predict that because of information technology, poverty will be cut by another 90% in Asia over the next 10 years. And they see similar, not quite as dramatic, but similar progression everywhere. Even Africa, we had a 5% growth rate uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest region of Africa last year because of information technology. And I've been studying these trends for 30 years. I actually decided I would be an inventor over half a century ago when I was five years old and quickly realized, I'd say 30 years ago, that the key to being successful as an inventor is timing. Uh, I get now lots of business plans and we, we do some mentoring and early stage investing and I would say 90% of the teams that give us proposals would do exactly what they say technically if given the resources. But 90% of those projects would still fail because the timing is wrong. Not all the enabling factors would be in place when they're needed. And realizing that, I became an ardent student of technology trends. And being an engineer, I gathered data and built mathematical models. And you would, you would think that you couldn't really predict where technology is headed, or that you couldn't predict that four years ago you would double the number of ARM processors in the next four years. But it turns out that these trends are remarkably predictable. Now, actually, specific projects, specific products, specific people are unpredictable. But the overall result of the growth of information technology follows remarkably predictable progressions. And you might wonder, how can that be? If every project is unpredictable, how could the overall progression be predictable? Well, we see other examples in science of that phenomenon. Uh, the classical example actually comes from the 19th century, thermodynamics. The path of each particle is unpredictable. In fact, it's modeled in thermodynamics as a random walk. If the overall gas, made up of a large number of randomly, chaotically, dynamically interacting particles, is very predictable according to the laws of thermodynamics to a very high degree of precision. So if you have a large dynamic system where each element is unpredictable, the overall results uh, follow certain predictable paths, and technology evolution is such a dynamic, chaotic system. And I'm going to show you a few dozen examples of just how predictable these trends are. Uh, we have hundreds of them. I have now a team of 10 people that helps me gather this data. And I say this now not just looking backwards and overfitting to past data and making these forward-looking predictions for uh, over a quarter century. Uh, my first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, written 20 years ago, uh, for example, predicted that this was written in the mid-80s, that by the mid-90s there would be a worldwide communication network tying together hundreds of millions of people. 
Uh, and that was actually considered ridiculous in the 1980s because you had the ARPANET, which a couple thousand scientists were using. Uh, and sure enough, it came, came to pass. In fact, generally my predictions, although they're considered radical when I make them, turn out to be somewhat conservative by design because I had predicted 95, 96, the first reference to the World Wide Web in the New York Times of 1993. I saw the chess supercomputers doubling in size every year, which added 40 points to the chess score, because chess scores is a log uh, scale. And that put the crossover to human, the, the human grand, uh, champion, world champion, in 1998. Uh, so Kasparov was asked about this in 1993, and he said, that's ridiculous. I've played the best chess computers in the world, and they're pathetic. They're brittle, they're predictable. They'll never touch me, which was true in 1993, but they saw it past them in 1997. And this brings up the key insight into information technology, which is that it progresses exponentially, not linearly. We're literally doubling the power, price, performance, capacity, bandwidth of information technology in a broad array of fields every year. Depending on what you measure, the doubling time might be 11 months, 12 months, 13 months. There's generally a slow second level of exponential growth. We're having exponential growth at the rate of exponential growth. And that's really, but doubling every year is quite dramatic power. Just think about how powerful this, and influential this technology is today. We'll multiply its capability by a thousand at the same price, same cost in 10 years, a billion in 30 years. And actually because of the second level of exponential growth, we'll multiply the power by a billion in 25 years. While at the same time we're shrinking, the size of these technologies also at an exponential rate, a factor of 100 per 3D volume per decade. So 25 years, that'll be 100,000. Uh, fold capabilities. So right now we can put pea-sized computerized devices inside the body and brain that are programmable from outside. You apply these trends, we'll have very powerful uh, devices that are the size of blood cells in 20 years that can perform therapeutic functions inside the body, go inside the brain through the capillaries and so on. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But another important point about information technology is not, not only that it progresses exponentially, but that the application of information technology is very widespread. Uh, of course, you've got two billion ARM processors, that's pretty wi widespread in a great diversity of types of products. But it also applies to things like biology. We're learning to reprogram our own information processes inside our, our body, and basically biology is a set of information processes, and that is also exponential. The Genome Project was not a mainstream project in 1990. Mainstream skeptics said, we just use our best PhD students, our most advanced equipment, and around the world we succeeded in collecting one ten thousandth of the human genome. This is going to take hundreds of years. And halfway through the 15-year project, seven and a half years later, the skeptics were still going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. I mean, here you are halfway through the project, and you've you finished one percent of the genome. But you double one percent seven times, and you get a hundred percent, and that's exactly what's happened, and that's continued since that time, and if you look at every other example, now reverse engineering the genome, expressing it in the proteome, and simulating proteins, and on and on and on, it's all progressing exponentially. And we're learning to reprogram biology. I mean, how much software do you have that you haven't changed in 30 months, let alone 30,000 years? Well, we have these 23,000 software programs inside us called genes that we haven't changed in thousands of years, and conditions are different. We have these two billion ARM processors, for example. We didn't have that a thousand years ago. Uh, calories were few and far between a thousand years ago. So if you happen upon some calories, probably because of a lot of hard work doing some hunting or growing food, you, wanted, you needed to store it. There were no refrigerators. You could store it in your body. So the fat insulin receptor gene, which basically says hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well, uh, made a lot of sense a thousand years ago. And that was actually the innovation in uh, biological evolution that allowed animals to roam around. Plants don't have a fat insulin receptor gene. But that now underlies an epidemic of obesity. What would happen if we turned that gene off? Well, that was tried. So we have this new technology just emerged three years ago, RNA interference. In fact, they just gave out a Nobel Prize a couple days ago for that technology, where you can if you find a gene, you can turn it off. So they turned off the fat insulin receptor gene in animals. These animals ate ravenously and remained slim, and it wasn't a fake slimness. They, got, they didn't get diabetes, they didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. Five pharmaceutical companies noticed, hey, that would be a good drug for the human market. And they're rushing to bring fat insulin receptor gene inhibitors to the human market. It actually brings up another 
interesting exponential progression, which is the rate of change, the rate of paradigm shift, is itself accelerating. According to my models, it's doubling every decade. So I was at a 50th anniversary a couple of years ago of the discovery of DNA, of the DNA structure. All of our speakers were asked, okay, what will the next 50 years bring? Every speaker there, except Bill Joy, who does concentrate on the downside of these technologies, and myself, who generally concentrates on the upside, but every other speaker used the last 50 years as a model for the next 50 years. So, so Jim Watson himself, the co-discoverer of DNA, said, oh, in 50 years we'll have drugs that enable you to eat as much as you want and remain slim. And I said, Jim, we've already demonstrated that in animals. And there are five pharmaceutical companies rushing to bring this methodology to the human market. It's going to be five to 10 years, not 50 years. Uh, people think linearly, even sophisticated scientists assume that the current pace of progress will continue at I talked to a brain scientist recently, or I had actually a public debate. He said, well, it took me 18 months to model this one ion channel, and there's four other ion channels, and this one dendrite, and this other dendrite has five ion channels. It's adding up all these complexities, 18 months each. It's going to be a century before we complete reverse engineering the human brain. As if nothing's going to happen in the next century. We're not going to have more powerful computers. We're not going to have more higher resolution scanners, when in fact, the, sp the spatial resolution of brain scanners is, du scanners is doubling every year. Uh, the amount of data we're getting on the brain is doubling every year. The, the power of the supercomputers to simulate all this uh, data and to understand it and reverse engineer it is doubling every year. Uh, according to my models, we'll have complete models and simulations of all several hundred regions of the brain within a couple of decades. So I want to take you through that. Uh, but first, I just want to share with you uh, latest technology from my own inventing career, uh, which actually is an ARM-based X-scale processor-based device. And it's actually a good example of this exponential growth of technology. I've been involved in reading machines for the blind for 30 years. And uh, the first, this is the new reading machine, uh, which a blind person can take with them. Uh, 30 years ago, we, we introduced the first Princess Peach reading machine, which was about a thousand times bigger, size of a dishwasher. Uh, much less powerful than this one. It's, over the years, it's come down in cost. Uh, the latest before this was a Kurzweil 1000, which sits on your desk. So even though it's fairly compact, the blind person has to bring printed material to their desk to read it. Uh, so having been involved in this field, I speak at a lot of disabilities conferences and was making predictions. Uh, someday, a blind person will be able to just take a device out of their pocket and read signs on the wall back of a cereal box, bank an ATM display, read the menu at the restaurant, not have to bring it back to their office. So four years ago, when you had a billion ARM processors, uh, the National Federation of the Blind, with whom I worked on the first reading machine, said, well, Ray, you've been talking about this for a long time. When, when do you think the embedded processors and digital cameras will be powerful enough to do this? And said, well, according to our models, uh, that'll be in four years, 2006. And they said, well, how long do you think it'll to develop, and I said, well, in addition to squeezing OCR and speech synthesis into a uh, PDA, we also have to develop a new layer of software because a uh, blind person is going to be holding the device, and there can be three different degrees of freedom of tilt and rotation. There can be uneven illumination, whereas the scanner provides controlled illumination. The pages can be curved. I, I listed about seven or eight uh, vagaries of real-world print taken with a handheld device, and we need intelligent image processing to clean that up. I said, okay, well, how long will it take? I said, well, about four years. And so they said, all right, let's get started. And uh, sure enough, th this is uh, an Xscale-based device. Uh, our models of your progress turned out to be exactly precise. And just months ago, the available, the records of PDAs and digital cameras had enough resolution, enough processing power. And what was surprising is we got the software done on time, and we introduced this uh, a few months ago. Uh, there are now about a thousand blind guys and gals walking around taking pictures and reading uh, the labels on their clothing, the spines of, of CDs and all kinds of real world print that they really had to do without before. So that's a good example, I think, of where technology is helpful. The system is on. Camera is off. I'm ready. Camera is on. You might want to turn the volume up. It has a pretty elaborate field of view field report. Field of view report. 
Top and right edges are visible. 53% filled. Taking picture. And <clears throat> it's fairly communicative. It tells you what's going on. Uh, it can adjust for any amount of rotation. Pre-processing picture. It'll tell me how, how rotated it is in a minute. Camera is one degree counterclockwise relative to the page. Okay, I hit it pretty well, but usually... Uh, page one, GNR 28 fluid. The AI winter is long since over. We are well into the spring of narrow AI. Most of the examples above were research projects just 10 to 15 years ago. If all the AI systems in the world suddenly stopped functioning, our economic infrastructure would grind to a halt. Your bank would cease doing business. Most transportation would be crippled. Most communications would fail. This was not the case a decade ago. Of course, our AI systems are not smart enough yet to organize such a conspiracy. Strong um. If you understand something in only one way, then you don't really understand it at all. This is because, if something goes wrong, you get stuck with a thought that just sits in your mind with nowhere to go. The secret, speaking cancelled. <clears throat> Camera is off. An unsafe goodbye. So that's a good example of uh, actually timing applied to my own technology projects, which is a primary application. But a fallout of being able to anticipate technology in the future is that we can talk about what technology will be like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now. And uh, we can actually build then inventions with the technology of 2025. We can't actually construct them, but we can imagine scenarios in our minds. And if anything, the future will be more remarkable than what we can anticipate today because you'll have all of your partners and companies all around the world, millions of people using creative ideas and uh, anticipating uh, all kinds of future concepts to apply to these very increasingly powerful computation and communication. Let me take you few, through a few examples of what we'll see uh, in the future and uh, then we can develop a just a few scenarios of what will be feasible 10 years from now and 20 years from now and so on. I mentioned the paradigm shift is actually doubling every decade. Uh, the telephone, uh, these are log graphs, so as you go up the graph it represents multiplying some key measure by factors of 10. So a straight line in a log graph is exponential growth. Uh, and very often we see a curved line on a log graph, which is better than exponential growth. But the adoption of the telephone, the first virtual reality technology, uh, took half a century, it took 50 years for a quarter of the US population to adopt it. The cell phone did that in seven years. Television, radio, telephone did that. It took decades to be adopted by a mass audience. Cell phone, uh, the PC, the web, did that in a few years' time. This is a, acceleration has continued. Five or six years ago, people didn't use search engines. That, that now sounds like ancient history. Three years ago, there were no social networks. Three years ago, people said you can't make money in internet advertising, now you've got to company with a hundred billion dollar market cap doing nothing but internet advertising. Uh, the word blog was not used three years ago. And I have a whole theory, which I talk about at the beginning of the book, and I won't belabor it, on why this is the case, that acceleration and the exponential growth of the products uh, are features of an, of, an, of an evolutionary process. It was true of biological evolution, and it was true of technological evolution. In fact, we see technological evolution emerge from the, the evolutionary process that created the technology creating species. And the reason for this is that an evolutionary process evolves some capability and then that uses that capability to evolve the next stage. So the next stage goes more quickly. So the very first paradigm shift in evolution, basically the evolution of biology itself, DNA, an information backbone to, to evolution, Actually, RNA came first. That took billions of years. But then evolution used DNA uh, ever since. And the next time all the body plans of the animals were formed, uh, went 100 times faster. It took only 10 to 20 million years. Then the body plans became a mature technology, and evolution concentrated on higher cognitive functions, and that only took a few million years. 
And then Homo sapiens, the first technology-creating species, evolved in only a few hundred thousand years. And it's actually only three simple genetic changes that distinguish us from our primate ancestors uh, that comprise only a few tens of thousands of bytes of information. We have a larger skull to enable a larger brain at the expense of a weaker jaw, so don't get into a biting contest with another primate. Uh, we have more of the brain devoted to the cerebral cortex, so we can do abstract reasoning to a greater degree. We can do what-if experiments in our mind. What if I took that stone and that stick and tied it together with that twine? I could actually extend my leverage, maybe add an arm processor along with that. Uh, and we have an opposable appendage, the thumb, that actually works, that enables us to take that thought experiment and actually change the environment and create tools and it's this literature that says that other animals create tools, they don't really create tools. I mean, a certain primates can use a stick, uh, but they can't shape the tools. Uh, they don't have a body of knowledge, of design, information that they pass down from generation to generation of increasingly sophisticated tools. So we can, could create technology, and then we always use the latest generation of technology to create the next stage in technology. Then, which you can see emerges smoothly from the biological evolution that created our species, also accelerated on this double log graph. And if, if we look at this on a linear graph, it looks like everything has just happened. But some people pointed out, well, okay, Kurzweil will only put points on this graph that fit on the straight line. And if there was a point that didn't fit on the straight line, I didn't put it on there. So I took 14 different lists from 14 different thinkers, Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, Encyclopedia Britannica, American Museum of Natural History, uh, a dozen other lists. And there is disagreement as to uh, when the Cambrian explosion took place. Some people think it took 25 million years, not 10 million years. Some people include the ARPANET with the internet, so it's 25 years, not 10 years. But there's a very clear trend line. Uh, nobody thinks the internet took a million years. Nobody thinks the Cambrian explosion happened in 10 years. A billion years ago, not much happened in a million years by anybody's uh, estimate. Uh, there's a very clear progression in biological and technological evolution. And if you look at the difference between an exponential and a linear progression, this is a linear graph, uh, they actually look very similar for a while until they divert, but when they divert, they divert quite radically. Uh, even at the steep part of that exponential, if you take a small piece of it, it looks like a straight line. A straight line a linear model is actually a very good approximation of an exponential model for a short period of time. But it, it diverts from reality quite dramatically for a long period of time. Most uh, government models are linear models and they work fine for the usual planning horizon of one or two years. They get to be absurd when we look out over several decades. And this is that MIT computer uh, compared to computers in the current era. But Moore's Law is really just one example of many. People, people have heard of Moore's Law, but that's really just one paradigm within computing. And computing itself, which has gone through five paradigms, is only one example of this exponential growth of information technology, what I call the law of accelerating returns. I put 49 famous computers here on a log graph, going back to the first data processing equipment used in the 1890 census. Uh, there was the first American census that was automated, used these old punch card machines that were subsequently shipped to the Florida Election Commission. <laughs> 1940s, Alan Turing cracked the German Enigma Code, so Churchill and Roosevelt had a complete transcription of all the Nazi messages. A lot of interesting literature about the dilemmas that provided them, because they knew what was going on, but they couldn't take action very often without tipping off the enemy that their code had been cracked. So there was a lot of subterfuges. They knew a convoy of ships was coming, they'd send over a lone flyer. The, the Nazis would say, oh, we've been spotted, but actually that was just to trick them to think that's how they knew where they were going to be. But the Battle of Britain, they just used the information without reservation. Otherwise, they would have lost. Uh, the Royal Air Force was outnumbered three to one. It gave us a launching pad for our D-Day invasion. So those are really base machines. 1950s, computers were built with vacuum tubes. CBS predicted the election of Eisenhower the first time the networks did that, 1952. They were then shrinking vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller to keep this exponential growth going. Now people say, well, exponentials can't go on forever. This is what Kurzweil doesn't realize. Exponentials always 
run out of steam at some point. Rabbits in Australia, they eat up all the foliage, they're growing exponentially, but then they hit a wall. That's true, every paradigm hits a wall, but what we see in information technology is as we get close to that wall, it creates research pressure for the next paradigm. Until we actually saturate the ability of matter and energy to do information processing, but this is gonna take us well through the 21st century. One cubic inch of nanotube circuitry at its limit would be 100 million times more powerful than the human brain. So we have plenty of capacity to go through different paradigms to reach those ultimate limits, and we're quite far from that today. But anyway, there were shrinking vacuum tubes that hit a wall. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tube and keep the vacuum, and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes, but it was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. We then went to transistors, which are not small tubes. It's a, a different paradigm. And now we've had several decades of Moore's Law, shrinking the key features on an integrated circuit, for several decades, and the end of that has been predicted for quite some time. The first predictions were 2002. Intel now says 2022. By that time, the key features will be four nanometers, which is 20 carbon atoms. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. And that will be the end of, of Moore's law, but that won't be the end of the exponential growth of computing. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, which is computing in three dimensions. I mean, we live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use a third dimension. Chips today are already nanotechnology, they're under 100 nanometer feature size, but they're flat. Our brain, which uses a very slow and cumbersome information processing method, sends signals as chemical signals, which travel a few hundred feet per second, a million times slower than electronics. The computing is done in the interneuronal connections at 200 calculations per second, which is you know, at least a million times slower than, than modern computation. But it gets its power by being organized in a massively parallel fashion, 100 trillion fold parallelism in three dimensions. And that is the direction that we're going to go in. Now, when I postulated that in my last book on this subject, The Age of Spiritual Machines in 1999, that was then a radical notion. That is now really a mainstream view. You can talk to the key chip, design, chip designers at Intel. They have three dimensional circuits self with self organizing features because you can't you know, place every wire. You really need some kind of self organizing paradigm. They have these systems already working in early prototype stages. They expect a crossover to three-dimensional circuits to happen in the teen years, well before we run out of speed with shrinking features on the two-dimensional substrate. And you'll notice that's not a straight line, that's another slow exponential. It took us three years to double the price performance of computing in 1900, two years in 1950. Year 2000, it was one year, it's now about 11 months. Uh, so we have exponential growth and the rate of exponential growth. And supercomputers marching along exponentially. Uh, according to, to my book, it would, it's going to hit 10 to the 16, 10 million billion calculations per second in 2013. That's a significant threshold because that's the most conservative estimate of the amount of computation we need to simulate the human brain. And I described four different ways of estimating that, all of which come out with very similar numbers. Uh, six weeks after the book went out to press, Japan announced two supercomputer projects to hit that level in 2010. And uh, we'll have enough computation to simulate all several hundred regions of the human brain for $1,000 by 2020. And I don't want to dwell on all these examples of Moore's Law, but, but look at this graph. This is the price transistor. When I was a high school student in New York, I would hang out at the surplus electronics shops on Canal Street, which is still there buy something about this big, which is a telephone relay with support circuitry, equivalent to one transistor for $40, only a lot slower. In 1968, I could buy a whole transistor, a lot faster than my relay and a lot smaller, for only a dollar. In 2002, you could buy 10 million, today it's 100 million. Now, you've all heard these fantastic comparisons of how far we've come with electronics, but what's really interesting about this chart is how smooth the progression is, how predictable it is. I mean, this is the measure of millions of people, designers, customers, thousands of companies, dozens of countries, all kinds of vagaries of human history, accusations of one country dumping products in another, wars, recessions, IPOs, bankruptcies. You'd think it'd be in a very erratic progression. And maybe there'd be a trend that you can kind of see in this very erratic uh, trend line. But no, it's a very smooth, very predictable progression, and we see this in example after example, despite the unpredictable nature of human affairs. And unlike Gertrude Stein's roses, it's not the case that a transistor is a transistor. 
as we've made them cheaper, they're better because they're smaller. The electrons have less distance to travel, and we've had smooth exponential growth in the speed. The cost of a transistor cycle is come down by half every 1.1 year. Now you add the other kinds of innovation that you're involved with, pipelining, data caching. You get a doubling of the price performance of electronics in, in every different area, including processors, every one year. And this also turns out to be true of data, genomic data, proteomic data, brain scanning data, databases of all kinds, software. Basically, there's a 50% deflation rate in information technology. Depending on what week it is, the economists will worry about deflation or inflation. I think the Fed and Bernie back on inflation. But they'll tell you that deflation's bad also. We had massive deflation in the American Depression. And the percentage of the economy comprised of information technology is growing, will be most of the economy by the 2020s. And the economists will say, well, that, that's going to lead to massive deflation, which is a bad thing. Because if people can get the same stuff, same capability, a year later for half the money, okay, they'll buy more, but they're not going to keep up with doubling their consumption year after year. So the size of the economy is measured in do dollars, it's going to shrink, uh, and that's a bad thing. But that's not what we see. We more than double our consumption. We've had 18% growth in the consumption of electronics, processors, and you cited a good example of the exponential growth of ARM processors uh, in doubling the number in only four years. We more than double our consumption each year. 18% growth in constant dollars over the last 50 years in information technology, despite the fact that you can buy twice as much capability each year for the same amount of money. I mean, people didn't buy iPods for $10,000 10 years ago, which is what it would have cost. When the price performance reaches new levels, whole new applications just explode on the horizon. And you certainly have experienced that uh, with, with the ARM architecture. It's true in every single area. I mean, it cost several billion dollars to collect the first genome. Now, uh, I spoke to the leaders of NIH, National Institutes of Health, two weeks ago. That they want to collect a million genomes so that they can tie genetic states to disease uh, to create better treatments. Now, that would have been un unthinkable uh, when one genome cost a billion dollars, but it's going to cost a thousand dollars very soon. Magnetic data storage, I mean, I just put that up because it's another example. of uh, These are different engineers, different engineering problem, shrinking magnetic spots on the substrate. Nobody talks about a Moore's law uh, for magnetic data storage, but it's the same progression. It's really an inherent feature of anything having to do with information. And as everything becomes information, uh, this is going to be uh, very important and very liberating, in my view. Uh, this the major area that's now uh, transforming from a pre-information era to a post-information area is the whole area of biology, medicine, and health. That used to be hit or miss. We'd find something. Oh, here's something that lowers blood pressure. We don't know why this works, but it seems to work. It has lots of side effects. 99% of the drugs on the market were done this way, drug discovery. The new paradigm is really to treat biology as information processes and develop information technologies that can reprogram it. And most of the new drug development is based on this idea of rational drug design. Uh, we can turn genes off, we can add new genes, we can turn on and off enzymes. Uh, Pfizer's torsetropeep turns off selectively one enzyme pretty cleanly at one stage of atherosclerosis, and the phase two trial showed it stops atherosclerosis, which causes 90% of all heart attacks. They're spending a record $1 billion on the phase three trial. That's just one example of thousands of, of drugs like that, using this, basically treating health and medicine as a information technology. And we're also putting a lot of embedded devices, embedded processors inside the human brain. There's, there's one now that you can swallow that uh, that does a lot of tests as it goes through your GI tract, transmits information, you pick up a little belt device and then the device disintegrates. Uh, there's thousands of examples of that. And we're going to be putting, increasingly putting computers, embedded processors, it's a new market for ARM architecture uh, inside our bodies and brains. And in biology, we went from $10 per base pair in 1990, it's a penny today. The slope represents a doubling of the genetic data each year. Communication, it's not just Moore's law, the, the number of bits we're moving around, the, the, the capacity, bandwidth of uh, communication devices, wired, wireless, measured many different ways. 
have doubling times of 11, 12, 13 months, depending on what you're measuring. And uh, here's that little graph I had in the 1980s. I had the left so little piece of the left side of the graph uh, when I wrote my first book and saw the ARPANET doubling in size each year. Uh, it was 10,000, now it was going to 20,000, but I saw that 10 years later that would be 10 million going to 20 million to 40 to 80 to 160 million. It would be a worldwide communication network. It's the explosive power of exponential growth. And we're shrinking technology at a, also a ex smooth exponential rate of, of 100 for 3D volume per decade. Uh, these are actually illustrations from Eric Drexler's pioneering 1986 book, which founded the field of nanotechnology. And these devices now have been simulated. And we, if the idea of a sophisticated blood cell sized device that can go inside the human body and perform diagnostic and therapeutic functions sounds very futuristic, I point out we're doing it already. Uh, one scientist cured type 1 diabetes in rats with a blood cell sized device, nano engineered, 7 nanometer pores, lets insulin out in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies, because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder. And this works quite effectively. It's going into human trials. Uh, at MIT, they've developed a, a blood cell sized device. This is quite sophisticated. It goes through five different stages uh, of its performance. It, it will detect the antigen specific to a cancer cell. When it detects it, it then can latch onto the cell. It then burrows inside the cell, detects that it's inside the cell, and then releases toxins and destroys the cancer cell. And this has worked uh, in tests. It's now undergoing extensive animal trials. And there are hundreds of examples of these blood cell sized devices. Right now, they're being experimented with in animals. This is the design of an artificial or robotic white, a red blood cell. Now, red blood cells are something we've reverse engineered. and it brings up an interesting observation about biology, which is biology is very intricate, but it's also very suboptimal as we actually learn its methods. For example, sending signals using chemical switching, uh, which travel a few hundred feet per second, a million times slower than electronics. Uh, biology got stuck with certain early assumptions. For example, everything's built out of proteins. And we, it's really stuck with those assumptions until it actually evolved a species that could go back and re-engineer them. So here we've re-engineered red blood cells. And these are hundreds of times more capable than your biological red blood cells. And as a conservative analysis of these resprocytes, as they're called, show that if you replace 10% of your red blood cells with these robotic versions, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath, or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. So, honey, I'm in the pool, will take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> And uh, this designer, Rob Friedis, has also designed a robotic white blood cell that can download software from the internet to combat specific pathogens. And, I remember, and I've mentioned there are already other devices that can do that, that can download software inside your body and brains. Uh, so these devices, if you apply what we can do already today and apply this billion-fold increase in price, performance, power, and capacity, over the next 25 years while well, we shrink the size of the key features in three-dimensional volume by a factor of 100,000 in that same time frame, uh, these scenarios are really quite realistic. And here's that exponential growth of computing projected into the 21st century. $1,000 of computation uh, will be equal to the human brain. And that will be an era where we will have really a rich environment of embedded processing. And processing is going from where we started, which was this MIT computer in IBM 794 that took, was, took up a much larger space in this presentation theater, to where today we have billions of embedded processors. Uh, we'll have trillions of processors deeply embedded inside the environment. They'll be computing everywhere, inside our bodies, in our environment, uh, as we go into the 2020s. And I would say it's a, it's a mainstream view today that we'll have plenty of computation to emulate the human brain by the 2020s. That was controversial a while ago, but people, anybody who really has studied this uh, does come to the conclusion, yes, we'll have plenty of, of hardware capacity to simulate the human brain by the 2020s. We already have simulations of about 20 regions of the human brain, and there are only several hundred. The key question now is where, where we'll get the software. And some of the software will come from ongoing experimentation in AI, but a, a key source of, of the software view intelligence is going to come from the human brain itself, and it's not hidden from us. 
but actually a few years ago it largely was hidden from us because the best technology was fMRI. You've probably seen those images. Uh, they're very interesting. Someone solves a certain logic problem. You can see this point in their brain lights up, but that doesn't tell you enough to actually reverse engineer how the brain does it. But we've had a doubling uh, of uh, the resolution of brain scanning in 3D volume every, every year. And the latest generation, that's got five or six exciting new technologies, can actually see in vivo, in a living brain, interneural connections and see them firing in real time. And we can actually see the brain create your thoughts, see your thoughts create your brain. And, we get, and the amount of data we're getting from these brain scans and also studies of individual neurons is doubling every year. But then the question comes up, can we make any sense out of this data? Maybe we're not smart enough. Uh, Doug Hofstadter said, well, maybe our brain is just below the threshold necessary to understand our brain. And if we were smarter and able to understand it, well, then necessarily our brain would have to be that much more complicated and then we'd never catch up with it. And maybe, that's a, maybe there's a mathematical theorem in there that a complex system can't be so complex as to understand its own complexity. But that's actually not what we find. What we're finding is that as we get enough data about specific regions, we are able to model them very precisely in mathematical terms. And if we can do that, then we can simulate them. And we've done that with 20 different regions. This is 12 regions of the auditory cortex, which a team on the West Coast has modeled and simulated. And then we can apply, they have applied sophisticated psychoacoustic tests to the simulation. They get very similar results as applying those same tests to human auditory perception. And there's a simulation of the cerebellum, which is actually an important region. It's where we do our skill formation. And it does involve pattern recognition, which is really the heart of human intelligence. And the cerebellum uh, comprises more than half the neurons of the brain. And this has been simulated. And uh, skill formation tasks applied to the simulation get very similar results. And it brings up another interesting question, which is how complicated is the human brain? Well, if you look at a mature human brain, it looks very complex. I've estimated it would take thousands of trillions of bytes of information to characterize all the internal connections, all the nonlinearities, all the ion channels, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look, take the cerebellum, for example. If I said, okay, here's a cerebellum, reverse engineer this. And I showed it to you, and you'd see trillions of deeply interconnected connections in, in very complex, convoluted patterns. You'd say, well, this is hopeless. I'm never going to be able to reverse engineer this. We have reverse engineered the cerebellum. It actually is quite simple. There's only a few genes that describe the design of the cerebellum, comprising only a few tens of thousands of bytes of information. Well, how do tens of thousands of bytes of information describe a, a system, the, the cerebellum wiring, which has trillions of connections? Well, most of it is random following certain rules. The, cer the genome uh, basically says the following about the cerebellum. There's four different types of one module is organized like this. Now repeat 10 billion times and add a little bit of random variation within each repetition. And that's basically what the genome says about the cerebellum. It's a few tens of thousands of bytes of information. And there's largely random details as to how the cerebellum is wired. As a child learns to walk and to talk and to catch a fly ball, it gets filled up with meaningful information. It's a self-organizing system that can respond to its environment. That's the secret of its design. But the design is not that complex, and we have actually figured out how that works and created an effective simulation of it. If you look at this particular design, you've probably seen this. This is the Mandelbrot set. It's on the picture of a book, uh, the title of which is Complexity. It's considered an example of a complex image. And it would take billions of bytes of information to represent the image of the Mandelbrot set at certain resolutions. And as we zoom in on the image, uh, we see complexity within complexity. So it's a very complex image. But the design of the image is only six letters long. That the Mandelbrot formula is six letters applied iteratively. It's a, it's a probabilistic fractal. And that's basically how the relationship of the genome to the brain is a probabilistic fractal. Because there's only, there isn't, there isn't that much information in the brain, in the, in the genome. The genome is uh, 3 billion rungs, that's 6 billion bits, that's 800 million bytes, but it's replete with redundancies. One sequence called ALU is repeated 300,000 times. If you apply lossless compression to the genome, you get 30 to 50 million bytes, which is less than Microsoft Word. And that is the design <laughs> of the human body and brain. But then as it actually gets 
implemented and creates a pancreas and a cerebellum and all these other uh, regions and, and organs, uh, it, the amount of information is greatly multiplied uh, with a very large stochastic or random function. But then the, the, the heart of the uh, power of the brain is in itself organizing to intelligently reflect the information that it absorbs. So a mature brain does have a, bil a billion times more information than the actual genome that uh, describes it initially. And all of this is uh, driving economic growth. I don't dwell on this, but we've gone from $30 to $130 in constant dollars uh, in uh, the value of a human hour of labor. Uh, the adoption of these technologies is exponential. He has smooth exponential growth in the adoption of e-commerce. It's now over a trillion dollars. Then you might say, wait a second, wasn't there a boom and a bust in these dot-coms? That, yes, there was, but that was a, a Wall Street phenomenon, not an actual market phenomenon or Main Street phenomenon. Wall Street looked at the internet and says, wow, this was in the late 90s. This is going to change everything. This is going to transform every business model. That was accurate. But it wasn't going to do, and it was going to do it so exponentially, but exponentially doesn't mean instantly. If you remember my internet graph, on a linear graph, the internet was growing exponentially, but it looked like nothing was happening for like a decade, and then finally it exploded in the mid-1990s. So three years later, around 2000, Wall Street looked again at the internet and says, it didn't change every business model. I guess we were wrong, and all the values went the other way. But then the reality actually caught up with it, and you do have now, for example, Google with a $100 billion market cap uh, doing nothing but uh, internet advertising. And uh, IT is growing, information technology is a share of the economy, it will be most of the economy by the 2020s. And uh, so let me show you one more example of technology which we put together and then spend a couple of minutes talking about some uh, scenarios that will be feasible uh, by the end of this decade, which isn't that far from now and in, in the 20, late 2020s. Uh, this is a translating telephone. We took our own speech recognition. We developed the first large vocabulary speech recognition in the 80s. We took a contemporary version of that. We developed the first speech synthesis in the 70s. We took a contemporary version of that, married it with language translation, which is actually coming along very well. Because the latest versions are using pattern recognition applied to very large databases, large corpora of translated texts. And I've been able to use this system to talk to people around the world. I talked to this woman in Germany. I spoke English. She heard me in German. She spoke German. I heard her in English. We were able to communicate just fine. Uh, because people misunderstand each other even if they're speaking the same language. But this will be a routine service of your arm-powered cell phone uh, early in the next decade. Oops. This is a demonstration, comma. This is a demonstration. Of a prototype of a quote translating end quote telephone, period. Von einem Prototyp eines übersetzenden Telefons. Within a few years, comma. Innerhalb einiger Jahre. We will be able to talk to anyone, comma. Wir werden fähig sein, zu jemandem zu reden. Regardless of their language, period. Ohne Rücksicht auf ihre Sprache. The rain in Spain, comma. La pluie en Espagne. Stays mainly in the plain, period. Reste dans les plaines principalement. Merci pour votre attention, period. Thank you for your attention. Sorry. Excuse my French. Uh, synthetic speech actually has gotten pretty natural sounding. That's not recorded speech, it's, it's synthetic speech. So, end of this decade, computers are really going to start disappearing physical objects. I mean, it's already happening. People lose their nano iPods. My whole photo collection is on a little flash card that's the size of my fingernail, and I have lost it. But it's going to be embedded in our clothing, it's going to be in our environment. We really will. Certainly that, that second decade of, the, of this century is going to be marked by 
pervasive computing everywhere. We're going to solve this problem of displays. I mean, people like large displays, you know, five foot high definition screens, which are quite expensive or very popular. But we also like devices to be this size or even smaller. How can we put a really large high resolution display in a device that's even tinier than this? Just to put it in your eyeglasses, this, these devices are already starting to emerge. Uh, I'm on uh, the Army Science Advisory Board, and the Army is uh, pursuing this quite actively. They have devices that can put the soldiers in full immersion, uh, visual, auditory, virtual reality environments, so it feels like they're in the weapon, but there's a whole movement to take them out of the weapon and have them in a secure location. The armed predator is an early example of that. Uh, surgeons use these devices so that they're operating on the eye. Eye is kind of small, they can be in an eye this big in virtual reality and do surgery on that, and that then their movements get translated into, into the movements of a robotic surgeon that does the operation on the actual eye. But these devices will be inexpensive, very high resolution uh, by early in the next decade. Uh, there, there are already companies that are beginning to provide these. One application can provide a high resolution virtual uh, screen hovering in the air, or it can take over your whole visual field of view, provide full immersion virtual reality. I actually have uh, a technology like this where I, I give about a third of my speeches using uh, three-dimensional virtual reality. I can't wander around like this. I have to sit, stand behind a special podium, but I look life-size. Uh, I'm three-dimensional. Uh, the, the audience sees the local background behind me as I move around. Uh, that's expensive technology today, but we'll be able to visit with each other uh, in full immersion virtual reality environments uh, quite routinely, like making a cell phone call early in the next decade. Uh, and very interesting, we'll have augmented reality, pop-up displays. These are starting to emerge on some cars now, but this, this will be built into our eyeglasses. So you look at somebody, it'll remind you it's their birthday next Tuesday. Remind you what their name is, that'll be very helpful. <laughs> and uh, we'll have effective language translation, we'll be interacting with virtual personalities to conduct routine transactions. Uh, there are early versions of, the, of these technologies already emerging. If we go out to 2029, it's really where these uh, trends become quite significant. We'll have 30 doublings or a factor of billion increase in the power, price performance, capacity of these information technologies, of the ARM-based processors, and every other aspect of information technology. We'll have reverse engineered the human brain. We'll be able to apply uh, a greatly expanded AI toolkit to, to the very powerful machines that will exist at that time that are very ubiquitous and pervasive. Uh, but it's not an alien invasion of intelligent machines coming from over the horizon to compete with us. We're going to merge with this technology. It's already getting very close to us. Uh, one of my companies is developing clothing-based uh, computing uh, to monitor your health. It's going to go inside our bodies and brains. Our early examples, as I mentioned, but this will be very ubiquitous. Uh, by the end of the 2020s, we'll have nanobots uh, going through our bloodstream, keeping us healthy from inside going inside our brain. So for example, one example, one application would be full immersion virtual reality from within the nervous system. You want to go in virtual reality, then none of us shut down the signals coming from your real senses, replace them with the signals that your brain would be receiving if it were in the virtual environment. Then it feels like you're in that virtual environment. And you could be an actor, move your hand, but it'll move your virtual hand. Your virtual body doesn't have to be the same body you have in real reality. Uh, so there's many interesting opportunities uh, design of new environments and new bodies will be a new art form. Uh, you'll be able to experience the experiences of someone else. People will put their whole flow of sensory experiences out on the web, the way people now put their images from their webcams out on the web. But most importantly, it's going to be an expansion of human intelligence, which this technology is already. We routinely do intellectual feats that would be impossible without our machines. Very few professionals today could do their jobs at all without the ubiquitous information technology we already have. And as we get closer and closer to it, uh, we're going to greatly expand the unique attribute of human civilization, which is our creation of knowledge, which itself is expanding exponentially. And I'll leave you with one more thought, which is this is all going to impact human life expectancy. That's not a new story. When our genes evolved, it was not in the interest of the species for people to live past child rearing, for the most part. So the Life expectancy was about 25, post-infant mortality. That's generally when you were done raising your children. Uh, human life expectancy was 37 in 1800. That's only 200 years ago. Schubert and Mozart uh, died in their mid-30s, and that was typical. 
There was no sanitation, so there were lots of bacterial infections. They didn't even understand what that was. There were no antibiotics, so many of them were fatal. There were all kinds of problems. We've come a long way in terms of improving the quality of life through the ubiquitous information technology we have today. And when we get to the mature part of this biotechnology revolution where we can reprogram the information processes that comprise biology, according to my models, we will be adding more than a year every year to your remaining life expectancy in about 15 years. So if you can hang in there, <laughs> we may get to experience the remarkable century ahead. Thank you very much.